was the kind of object for the artistic manipulation. So we have the previous structure when we talked about yesterday when we spoke about the touch and the touch point. And it's really interesting to hear to you when we are speaking about the voice and the Uh, 
and I'm, I'm actually interested in doing that at the moment. But, but there are also limitations. There are things you can't do live. There are a lot of things you can't do live. Um, it's to do with causality. If you do something live, you have to cause it, and then it happens. But it's possible to do things backwards uh, in the studio, like the, the Hitler voice thing. You hear the siren first, and the Hitler voice later. Whereas live, you have to hear the voice first and the transformation later. So, um,
So uh, I, what it means uh, for me, I mean in practical terms, is that I do uh, make my own puppets, that I do perform them. Uh, I also, as an extension of that activity that I've been involved in for many years now, do also design and direct larger productions, which means, of course, collaborating with larger groups of people. But the process is, is still very much the same. And uh, of course, the idea of making a puppet to accomplish a specific, or to play a specific role or accomplish a specific task is very, very close, I think, to a lot of what, what we've been talking about in the past couple of days. Um, it's also very, very uh, integral to the whole tradition of puppet theater and has become even more important probably in the 20th century than it ever has before in that each uh, puppet performer or, or company has a style that is dictated by the, the, the nature, the look, the mechanics, the movement possibilities and so forth of the, of the puppets that they use. There is no such thing, there are no such things as puppet factories. There, there, are no, there practically are no puppet makers anymore. Uh, in countries where there are so-called traditions, uh, Indonesia and so forth, there, there has been a, a, a division of labor over the centuries into those who make puppets and those who perform with them, which is something that was uh, attempted in the uh, ex-East Bloc countries during uh, a number of uh, decades where there, there, were, there, was a, there was huge state support for the art of puppetry, and, uh, and they divided they kept workshops where puppets were produced and the, and the performers who were mainly actors who performed the figures. But that's already some, at some point, uh, a situation of some remove from what we like to think of as being the essence of puppet theater, which has become more and more important to uh, practitioners of puppetry in the past few decades because of the challenge of various other media, the, the need to define what puppetry is. In, is there such a thing as, as contemporary puppetry, or is it just a kind of you know low tech? Um, form or, or an evolved form of some other kind of theater or, or, uh, or even film. So anyway, um, uh, the issue though of, of making making the puppet, and I'll just you know, say this quickly because it's something that uh, people keep coming back to. Um, there is, I mean, we, we talk a lot also about the resistance in the material. What's true of puppet theater, and I think in many ways uh, typifies uh, all of this, this uh, that issue that we've been discussing is that in a puppet performance, the essence of the performance really is about the interaction, the tension, the conflict, if you like, between the performer and the object that he's manipulating, whether that object is, is figurative or very abstract or, as in many contemporary shows, just, just an object. Um, uh, in some, to carry that even farther, a hand when puppetry was responding to the the, uh, uh, the naked actor on the empty stage movement in theater, puppeteers were doing pantomimes as the as the uh, the puppet the puppet uh, example of that tendency. So um, so what that really means is that it's not it's not about the gesture that's produced. It's not that's a secondary interest. The uh, uh, getting a puppet to wave goodbye in a very you know, old-fashioned sense um, is, uh, is less significant to the art form than the, the effort involved in making that happen, which means that there are really two kinds of puppet theater <coughs> that we, we recognize now. And but there's puppet theater that really um, focuses the audience attention on that, on that effort. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a three-way like three uh, activity. There is there's the, the, the puppet that is acting, there is the, the performer that is getting it to accomplish whatever the, the, jet, the, the task is, the, the gesture that's, that's performed. And there has to be for uh, uh, puppet theater to be puppet theater in the pure sense, audience complicity with that. In other words, the means of the of, achieve, of the achievement of that gesture gesture has to be recognized by by the audience, even if it's not necessarily seen. So, um, 
So now this has become a very important point, given the fact that the word puppet is thrown around very, very loosely and very widely nowadays, particularly in Hollywood, where any kind of special effect dummy is called a puppet. And anyone who performs a special effects activity, like making, for example, the telephone receiver, I was actually called in on a Woody Allen film to advise them about getting the telephone receiver to lift off of the cradle and move in the air all by itself, which was for a film called Alice, in which the human being was supposedly invisible. And they were having a great deal of trouble getting this to happen. They had a very elaborate robotic kind of thing. And the problem was that the telephone kept missing the cradle on the way back. I mean, just by a very, very fine amount, but still it made it look like the person who was doing it was a little bit, you know, a little bit gone, you know. So we put a rod on it. We set it at low tech so that you could put a rod on it. It was very simple. But the issue of a puppet being then a machine, an automaton, there's a very, this is something that, as I said, that Eric mentioned earlier, it goes back more than 100 years. The need for puppeteers or the desire for puppeteers, for whatever reason we may now attribute it to, to assert the fact that a puppet is not an automaton. And that's a very interesting, it's interesting that that's such an important point and has been consistently such an important point. And even in the early 19th century, for example, where the most sophisticated from a, and realistically sophisticated puppets were string marionettes, which were intended, part of the, you know, the aesthetic response involved in watching string marionettes was to see how, just how lifelike they could be, just how much like human beings. And of course this was happening at the same time that automata were being developed with incredible sophistication. And at roughly the same time that people began more openly talking about the human body as a machine. So, but there, in spite of puppetry's proximity to that and the apparent visual relationship between a puppet and an automaton, puppet performers have been very insistent from that time to the present about the fact that it isn't. And I think that there, again, the emphasis is, yes, puppets can accomplish that. And in fact, puppetry coupled with contemporary media like film, for example, is, you know, aspects of puppetry, I should say, has become a very normal, it's become such a normal part of our daily lives that we now, you know, I think for that reason, puppetry is becoming a kind of accepted art form. Rarely do you turn on the television when you don't see some form of manipulation of images or three-dimensional animation. The use of prostheses and animated figures and even in kind of normal film now has become very, very, very common. And of course, by extension, we now, in what New Yorkers are calling a, you know, post-humanist era, we now openly embrace the idea that a human being is a kind of machine or automaton. For centuries, puppet theater was held in fear a little bit and kept on the outside of society for very much for that reason. The fact that there was this feeling that it was in some ways anti-human. Even through the 20th century, the biggest debate and dialogue in theater about puppetry has been this notion that the puppet is some kind of threat to the actor. And people, you know, go back to Gordon Craig, for example, who had developed his theory, the Uber Marionette, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, in which he posited, you know, he looked to a day when, you know, actors would be replaced by these so-called Uber Marionettes. And there's a lot of discussion about what that really means. 
But the idea that a puppet is in some way better than or can do things that an actor can, and even puppeteers have fallen into this trap. And you read all, I mean, I've heard as recently as a couple of months ago at a conference of a critic on puppet theater saying, well, puppets can do this and they can do that and actors can't. Well, yes, it's true, puppets can fly, actors can't, but they don't do it all by themselves. And that's the really, as obvious as that sounds, that's the really fundamental, it's a fundamental aspect of puppet theater that is often overlooked. It's, I guess, again, a product of the illusion. So in the 20th century, to kind of, in a reaction to that idea that puppets are somehow autonomous, and also because puppeteers, somewhat in the spirit of what Tim was saying yesterday, puppeteers were feeling a little, you know, a little neglected, a little hidden, as it were. Puppeteers began to emerge from what in the West had become the puppet proscenium and show themselves on stage with their puppets. And suddenly everything changed. And this has been a very, very recent phenomenon. I myself performed at a festival of specifically puppet theater in Berkeley, California, where I was told the next day that there was a really, really violent debate about whether I ought to have been, I was visible, about whether I ought to have been visible or not, and whether that meant that it was not really a puppet show. And so that trend has carried through to the present. But as puppeteers began emerging from behind whatever it was that masked or hid them, they began also, and this happened for the first time like in the 1950s and 60s in Europe, and European countries, European and those countries, the puppeteers began talking about what their puppets as musical instruments. And that was a first kind of new trend in the attempt to define what a puppet was. And suddenly this whole language of the descriptive language that is often used for the performer, the musician with his musical instrument, began to be applied to puppetry. The result was that puppeteers began to be seen more like virtuoso. Their performances were more seen for the virtuosity of the performance. And what effectively happened is that people began looking less at the puppet and looking more at the performer. I remember seeing a show, a stereotypical example of that, in which the performer strode out on stage and presented himself, I won't mention his name, and said, one man, two hands, ten fingers, a thousand marionettes, and began to dove into this performance, which was very much about his dexterity and his ability to manipulate the puppets. So this was a fairly short-lived phenomenon, although there are still very good examples of people doing that. Albert Grosser in Germany, for example, still performs in that vein and in the spirit of that time. In a reaction against that a little bit, or maybe a further evolution of his attempt to redefine what the puppet was, people began using, in Europe especially, because it doesn't quite work in English, people began talking about puppetry as figure theater, in an attempt to get away from the word puppet, because the word puppet or marionettes in various European languages is a loaded term. It has so much baggage attached to it that puppeteers began looking, who were doing much more serious theater, began looking for alternatives to describe the puppet. And they came up with the term figure theater, which is also still very current, and which, as I said, doesn't quite work in English, but in Italian, French, German, it's still very, very current in Germany. And the problem, of course, which this whole, it was an attempt to put the emphasis and the focus back on the puppet, but the puppet as a kind of art object, or an object capable of artistic expression. 
But very soon after that term began to be used, there was a whole theoretical backlash against the idea of figurative and representational art. And so, of course, the word figure had its problems. And the response to that was yet another attempt to redefine the puppet as an object in the purest sense. And people, younger companies, began a movement called the theater of objects, which is basically, it coexisted in particularly the 1970s and early 80s with the growth of the performance art movement and what we call visual theater, for lack of a better term, in the United States, which, of course, includes people like Robert Wilson and so forth. So the theater of objects, then, of course, what this has led to is innumerable numbers of meetings and conferences and so forth in which people are talking about what a puppet is. And we've gotten to a point after probably 15 years now where people are beginning to say, I don't want to talk about it anymore because there is no resolution. But the fact that there is the focus now in the world of puppet theory is on that most essential point. What is a puppet? What is the definition of it? When does something become a puppet? When is it not? My own approach has been to say that a puppet only exists in a virtual sense, that if any object is a puppet, its puppet, or can be a puppet, is a puppet only when it's being used as a puppet, which means that when you put it back down again, it becomes glass once again. And, of course, the difference between that and a puppet, a sculpted, articulated figure like the kind you might buy on the street in Prague, is evident. And yet, the kind of puppet that you buy on the street in Prague is not any more of a puppet in this true, pure sense than the glass that you pick up and use as a puppet. So my theory has been to put the emphasis on that, to put the existence of the puppet in time, in motion, in use, so that it's a kind of kinetic virtuality. I don't know if that's dangerous to use here, but anyway. So then that, of course, raises the, or leads us to the issue, I'm going to finish quickly so we can get some questions back, of is a puppet, is its ultimate goal then the illusion of life, or even the imitation of life? Even if we take a more, what I like to call, primitivist approach to puppetry, and we reject as secondary, not reject totally, but we view as secondary the illusionistic attempts of Hollywood and so forth, or even the German marionette theater to imitate life convincingly. It's still the magic of puppet theater, as it's often referred to, is often in those moments where the object is manipulated or handled in such a way that it conveys to the audience, or with the audience complicity, we believe in it. We believe in it, or we give it credence. And we even will empathize with it in a conventional, traditional, theatrical sense. And there is something very strange about that. And it's something, even as a performer, I often think to myself when I go out on stage, and I have these things there, and they're things, and I know they're things. And even if I have my own superstitious tendencies, I feel the audience responding, I get absorbed in it, and that potential for absorption, identification, whatever you want to call it, is curious, and is obviously fundamental to human nature, or puppet theater would not have survived through all of the centuries that it has. And we still wouldn't be doing it. I'm still not quite sure I know why I am doing it. So what that means is that the illusion of life is not really what it's about. That it's kind of a byproduct of it. 
What it's really about is the indication of the potential for infusing life into something that has none. And that in itself is such a stimulating thought that even if it's not conscious thought, I personally believe that that's where the aesthetic response of the audience lies. That is what makes it possible for people to be hooked on this kind of performance. That, of course, points us also in the direction of something that has come up a couple of other times, and that is the notion of animism. Animism and animation are not the same thing. Animation, which is often used, the big words in puppetry are animation and manipulation. You hear them constantly. And animation, of course, which means, really means that you are breathing, I think someone even said it yesterday, breathing life into something or putting life into something, is how puppetry is often described. And, of course, now so is what we now call animation on television or computer screens or in film. And that's not really, really what's happening. What really is happening is much closer to the animistic viewpoint, which Western theorists have only very recently begun to recognize as possibly having some, or at least having some validity, or at least being given equal time. And we find, for example, in Indonesia, which is the most sophisticated and most highly evolved animistic tradition, the notion, it's very clear that the puppet is, that whatever life or anima or soul, however you want to describe it, enters into the puppet in the moment of performance, it's coming from someplace else, someplace outside the performer. And the performer is really there, in the case of Indonesian countries, the gods, the gods, the ancestors. And the performer is there as a kind of intermediary or priest, as a, you know, he awakens the puppet in such a way that the spirit, from wherever it comes, can infuse, temporarily inhabit or possess the puppet figure. And although the puppet goes back to being a thing after it's being used, from being possessed over a period of time, it acquires a kind of a sacred quality, which those of us who perform with puppets are very sensitive to, actually. That's the superstitious realm. But if we use that as a model, what we see is that the puppeteer, any puppeteer, even the opera performer, theater object performer, when he takes an object and performs with it, is really trying to tap into some other energy, as it were. It's not so much a form of self-expression that's going on, as it is an attempt to channel other, you know, other forces, other energies, even if you look at it in the most simple and mundane way, and that is to find the potential in the material or the object itself. And, okay. Well, maybe I should ask if there are any questions. Well, I'll say one more thing. Okay. If we, you know, as we believe in New York, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, that we are now, you know, as, I mean, what makes us post-humanist is the fact that we now don't mind the idea that our body is like a car that we can take into the shop, and maybe we can even improve a little with plastic surgery or prosthetic devices or, you know, surgical implants. And so that's a big change in terms of our attitude towards humanity and ourselves. And, of course, suddenly it would seem, if puppet theater were the bad guy under the old, in the old world view, that suddenly it would shift. And, yes, there is a kind of embracing now of the non-human when we see it in popular culture everywhere, right? But, you know, we would love to think that our rugs are going to, you know, come to life and come over and snuggle up with us, and we think that's great. You know, why not? You know, an animate rug, you know, that definitely can also massage you as well as, you know, sit on the floor and you can walk on it. But when we imagine these things as being 
possible and okay. But what the answer, what I would say is that the puppet still, even in a world, if we can imagine a total shift in which the human being is basically a machine in his own, in his own, from his own viewpoint, the puppet would still represent the other. And that's a very, very fundamental point for me. Okay, that's So, 
as a, you know, and that's something we often talk about in the public world as kind of warning sign to people who, you know, just want to push public in the direction of realism. Um, it also argues, often argues against doing Shakespeare with puppets. Struggles against the strings, and then when they're cut, dies. You know, 
But it's that the distance is clearly, you know, the distancing factor in terms of the creation of the illusion is very, very fundamental, even when the puppet is very close to you. So that, for example, in the case of my, I mean, my puppets are very hands-on. You know, and wherever possible, I get rid of everything. Like if I take the hand myself, I take it, you know, sometimes there's a rod, sometimes not. But at the same time, by maintaining even the sort of, I see it as like, you know, putting two magnets together, you know, that have a kind of like attraction, repulsion thing going on at the same time. And by maintaining that sense in the manipulation, I find that that communicates itself also to an audience in terms of the, you know, the awakening of that, you know, desire to see it as at least semi-autonomous, which is part of the picture. You know, we can't, I mean, we can't, you know, it's still part of it. And... Are you saying you don't want it to be autonomous? No, I'm not saying it should or shouldn't. But I mean... Yeah, but like for the person, for the puppeteer to see someone controlling something in the park, would that be kind of not considered... Well, what I'm saying is that it's part of the mechanism. Well, what I'm saying really is that the distance is part of the mechanism of illusion, obviously. You know, or, you know, even if it's the illusion of distance. I mean, remote control is the ultimate distancing device because you don't see any touch. You don't see any, you know, you don't see the point of connection. But for me, for example, to be able to move a puppet, I mean, you know, we talk about these sorts of things. Like, you know, if I was doing something in the kitchen in New York, for example, and the puppet were in Dublin, and I could manipulate the controls in New York and see, you know, with the video broadcast, see the puppet moving in Dublin, I would get a thrill out of that. But there's still, you know, the... I mean, I recognize that if I can do it today and I get a thrill out of it, in 20 years, every 10-year-old kid will be able to do it. And so that the art, in a way, I mean, that's another word we haven't often, you know, stumbled onto. But for me, there's a point where technology and art are not coterminous. You know, I mean, I... A lot of... I mean, it's playing with new technology. You know, the great fear we all have in the puppet world is that, you know, that new technology is going to eventually become old technology. And if all you're doing is being the first one to use it, it's, you know, it's really what you express, you know, with it that becomes... that gives it its lasting, you know, dangerous word, value or whatever interest. I mean, my... As far as my being answered to your question is concerned, my... I mean, my own relationship to my puppets is, you know, puppets... I mean, you know, puppets are strange... They are strange things. And I do understand all of the mumbo-jumbo that's associated with them. There's a very famous story that I'd like to mention. In the 16th century in Geneva, we have... Puppet history is just a few documents, you know, scattered across the centuries. In the 16th century in Geneva, there was a puppeteer who was arrested. And we have the, you know, we have the records of this. He was arrested and tried for, you know, traffic with the devil because he was, you know, manipulating this puppet and it looked like it came alive, basically. So he was tried for this. And in order to defend himself from the charge, he demonstrated how it was done. You know, in other words, he showed the inquisitors, you know, what... you know, how he made it work. After they saw the demonstration, they were even more convinced that he was burned at the stake than he was. So there's... I mean, there's something about... You know, I mean, again, to go back to the animistic thing, I mean, there... I mean, I believe this because I experienced it, okay? But again, now we're in the... This is the rational, irrational area, right? But, you know, when you use something and you feel... I mean, someone was talking about, you know, when you touch... Yesterday, I think, when you touch something, you are being touched, even if all of the... You are the agency, you know? I mean, it's... You know, you feel the response. But that's all the more true of an object that you are pretending, if you like, is alive momentarily for an audience or whatever. I mean, there... You know, there's that much more tendency to begin to view the object as something with which you have a kind of 
you know, give and take relationship. Also, when you perform with puppets, there are moments where, I mean, I go on stage and I feel great, you know, like I'm going to do a really good show because, you know, I, you know, I had a great meal and I'm, you know, I'm a good spirits and, you know, and, 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 you know, you go on stage and start your show and puppets don't cooperate, right? Now, what is it that, what is it that doesn't, you know, I mean, like, is it gaff? No. You know, why are they sticking? Why is when I move the arm this way is going like that, you know? I mean, so there are, so it becomes a struggle then with, and you begin inevitably, psychologically, you begin to view the puppet as something, you know, that has a will of its own. I mean, yesterday someone was, I think that, you know, last evening with our little robot, you know, we were talking about, it, you know, having being or a mind of its own. Well, you know, it's maybe the illusion in this case of a mind of its own, but you, of course, inevitably, you begin to believe in it. I mean, maybe to the point where even you start making comments to the puppets before the show, you know, or you know, <laughs> it, can go, it can go pretty far. But, um, well, that's very much into the kind of Indonesian tradition where everything has an animal. Yes. And you more or less have to ask a chair to be able to sit on it. And yeah. ask the best to be able to wear it. Yeah. Otherwise, it will just break down. Yeah. But it's, and it's, it's also true that I, I mean, it drives me practically insane <laughs> when I see someone actually touch the puppet. Because then inevitably someone will someone else will touch the puppet as if it were a, a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've begun to know, you know, I mean like I, I lift it in certain ways, you know, I, I, I you know I never touch the face and hands. And there's and so in a way you're you're imbuing it with kind of sacred qualities. And um, I've noticed when I've directed plays, for example, with people who have actors who have had no real prior experience of, of puppetry, when one of them suddenly jumps when a props person or a set person comes on stage to lift the puppet and move it, then that's when I realize they now they're really you know they're getting it because because they begin to so you know they begin to develop that same kind of protective feeling about the the, the, the puppet and the way it's placed, the way it sits, and so. Um, so, you know, that's why I keep them in the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm working uh, on a daily basis with a figure with uh, adapting uh, outside of, of me, and I, I keep on hearing you say that you bring life to figure or speakers or whatever. And, um, but uh, do you work with the fact that from the figure, and I don't mean Anna or anything, uh, to bring life back to to yourself or to uh, a colleague. Do, do you have, do you know a sense of, of that it could be used as a tool, or um, uh, is it only a one way? Comes it? Well, I didn't say that actually that, that, that I'm giving life to a figure. I was I was saying that that that's actually not that that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. And, and uh, of course, the notion of animation is, that's what it is, right? That you, you are breathing life into something. In fact, animation is just another name for that illusion of life that is, you know, the, one of the goals and purposes of, of a lot of puppetry. Uh, but, um, and, and one of the aspects of puppetry. I mean, it is definitely, you know, it's not... not no, my question goes about the other way. If, if, if whatever you put in the picture, um, Right. Um, well, you know, this, you that's a subjective. I think that's a subjective. I would have to give a subjective answer to that, like, you know, because it's. I mean, you know, I mean, but I personally, from my experience as a puppeteer, you know, it is true that that philosophies or uh, um, you know theologies, even you know that that uh, that see the world as being charged with life, if you like, are much more. Um, Hospitable to the thinking of the puppeteer in terms of the you know the, the practice of the puppeteer than uh, than uh, you know uh, than Western philosophies which basically you know make a very clear distinction distinction between dead things and living things. So um, you know that's but that's a realm that you know that there's you know there's a lot of what 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 people choose to believe and what they choose to practice is often very very different. I mean, the, the, uh, the puppet theater in Indonesia, as a case in point, uh, is, and, and it's worth mentioning that puppet theater is the one kind of theater that has persisted everywhere 
even in very iconoclastic cultures, even in Iran, for example, through the centuries, the one type of theater that has survived and been kind of, you know, an admittedly very low level, but that has been puppet theater. So in Indonesia, you have a kind of overlaying of cultures where the opening of the performance always begins with an invocation of Allah, which is usually a line or two, and then is followed by basically the narrative setup, which usually it means that, you know, when Shiva was in the seventh heaven with his 37th consort and so forth, and immediately then launches into the Hindu pantheon to set up the story, and then gets down to the business of the puppet show, which is, although it's, you know, put into the religious framework of Islam and the narrative framework of Hinduism, is basically a pre-Hindu and pre-Islamic performance in terms of what it's, you know, what it's really, I mean, it's shamanic, to use the word that Tim introduced yesterday. So... I really liked Letitia's analogy to, from the puppeteer and the puppets to the performer with new technology, and I was wondering if I could ask you a question from maybe that standpoint. In the last couple of days, we talked about the difference between control and influence. Now, do you see your job as being more of a controller of the puppet or more of an influence, and are there puppeteers who place themselves at different places along the continuum? Yeah, yeah, well, okay, but learning, I mean, learning to manipulate a puppet is like learning to play a musical instrument. It takes a lot of practice, and the more you do it, you know, the better you get at being able to achieve the so-called desired results, which means that there are desired results. There are...